solution to this problem. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, this is the word of the Lord. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we commit this time of worship to God? Father, we thank you for your word. And thank you, Lord God, that um, you, you, you love to draw us close to you. Lord, you don't want to keep us from isolation or from alienation, and you desire us. It's like what Josh was saying earlier, Lord, um, you're after us, not what we can give to you, but you're after that relationship with you. So help us, even today. Lord, our heart's desire is to be closer to you. Thank you for your promise. You said you never drive away those who draw near you. And God, even as we draw close to you, would you embrace us, hold us, help us receive what you have in your heart to give the Holy Spirit. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, this, is, this series, I, I love it, super invigorating to me. You know, uh, growing up, this idea of holiness, even when I was a new Christian, you know, it's kind of like, What's that? What's that? Holiness. And then the pastor would preach calling us saints. I scratched my head. Back then, you know, um, I still had hair. Maybe I scratched too much. That's why. <laughs> but, you know, this, this idea of being a saint, it's too much. Oh, can you look at the person seated next to you? Does, does that person look like a saint? Exactly. That's what I... <laughs> I felt, you know, like, I don't see any halo. Maybe if you're wearing all white, you know, and then you smile, there's that shine that I see, that light, you know, it's beaming. But this idea of holiness, you know, we've been going through this. It's an examination of uh, holiness and what it's like. How do we participate in this holiness? And... We've been seeing that God is not just, you know, that's, it's not just one aspect or one attribute, one facet of his nature and his character. It's the summary of all that he is. He is holy. And it's from that word in Hebrew, it's kadosh. In, in, in uh, Greek, it's that word uh, hagias. You know, it's being set apart. Literally, the, the idea is being separate. It's to divide. That's the idea, and that's the word where it came from. And from the very beginning, we've been, you know, um, journeying from the very first book in Genesis, you know, how God really has been separating from the very beginning so that there's relationship that can, that can uh, occur and, and thrive and flourish. You know, he established time, created space, and provided resources. And created human beings, set them af apart from all the created things and created beings. He created humans in his image, according to his image and his likeness. And so they walked face to face, having that relationship. Nothing was hindering them from um, having that relationship face to face, talking with God. They were naked, but they were not afraid. You know? And... Last week, we, we uh, looked at that idea as, as um, Dr. Nick uh, Cash. He, you know, he coined this um, idea that holiness is relationship in its purest form. And that's what they were, uh, Adam and Eve were experiencing in the garden. You know, before a holy God, you know, that relationship, that fellowship. And God calls humanity to holiness. 
He invites us. Jesus said, come follow me. The very first disciples, these were the first words that they heard from him. It's an invitation into a relationship. Invitation from a person to a person. He didn't say, come follow a set of creeds or rules or commandments or join an institution, become part of a church, a church, 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 be a Christian. But he, he said, come follow me. And so relationship with God is holiness completely restored. We saw that from last week, and it's all God's work. It's, it has nothing to do with what we can do for him. Like what Josh was saying earlier, God is not after what we can give him. It's not after how we can perform here in this world, you know? Just like any other religion, it's all, all like that. It's, it's man's attempt to reach to God. But Christianity, it really is about God reaching out to men. And so, you know, um, Adam and Eve, we see in, in Genesis chapter 3, sin came in. And there was the fall of man. When sin came in, they decided, you know, um, to rebel against God. What did they do? They ate of that fruit, thinking this way, I can be like God. They listened to the serpent. You know, I can define good and evil in my own terms. Maybe God is, you know, holding something from me. Maybe he's a KJ creator, you know, limiting me. And so they rebelled against God, and sin came in. And they realized that they were naked, and, and they were scared. What did they do? They sowed fig leaves, these big leaves, but they're, um, they're magaspang. These are uh, itchy, you know, uncomfortable. They're not proper covering, but just to cover their shame before a holy God. That's what they did. And so what God did, we saw... He actually killed an innocent animal and took the skin so that he can give them a proper covering. Wow. You know? And so it's a foreshadowing, really, of God's heart reaching out to men. You know? It's a foreshadowing of the coming of Christ, the innocent lamb who takes away the sin of the earth, who died on the cross so that there's that proper covering. We can be covered from our sins. It's all a work of the generous, generous God. Um, hang on a second. I thought I'm not this tall. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's going down. Thank you, Patrick. All right, that's better. Just like the leather skin. It's better. All right. Okay, so, um, yeah. Why did he send his own son, gave his one and only son to us? Is it because we're worth it? Is it because we're good enough? We deserve it? He did it all for love. Right? He did it all for love. And so we're going to be talking about holiness, ho holiness lived. Holiness lived. Why do we need to choose to live this way? Why? Right? And if it's possible to live this way, you know, if, if this way that sometimes we think... Um, you know, it's a boring kind of life. Do you think sometimes? I used to think hol holiness, you know, it, it means it's like the hermits, you know, they, they separate, they isolate, they alienate themselves, go to the mountains and ride mountain bikes forever. <laughs> it doesn't sound boring to some, some of you, I know. But, yeah, if it's even possible to live a holy life, how do we do it? You know? Can we just live 
the kind of life that we always knew, you know, maybe in your mind you go, okay, if I choose to go that direction, will I make it? Is it even possible? So why do I need to choose holiness and how do I live a holy life? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, Ephesians chapter um, 2 Verses um, 1 to 3, this is what Paul said. And by the way, Ephesians and Colossians, these are like um, some scholars would call them twin epistles, uh, twin letters, because um, Paul wrote them at the same time during the same period of imprisonment, just addressed to two different churches. And the, the, the book of Ephesians, there were letters that were found that um, to the church in blank. It's not even uh, Ephesus per se, but it's an open letter, meaning it's for all the Christians uh, in, that, in, the, in the Christian, Christian world at that time, the first century. And so Paul, in chapter 2, he wrote to the church in Ephesus, he said, as for you, you were what? Dead. You were dead in your what? In your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, uh, the, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, he included himself. He is the great apostle. He said, all of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and, the following, and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature the serving of wrath, including him. Who among you knows that we are all like that? What do we deserve? Do we deserve the et eternal life that God offers to us? Do we deserve his goodness and his, and his kindness? Because, you know, how often do you sin? Maybe that's kind of... Uh, you know, people don't talk about sin uh, anymore. Like, sometimes we call it mistake. Okay, how often do you commit that? Make a mistake, you know, hurt your spouse or your siblings or your friends. You know, we are all sinners. What the Bible says is that no one is good, not even one. Paul write, wrote that in, in, in Romans chapter 3. Not even one. Well, that person seated next to you, that, may, that person may look kind and honest and pretty, but that person, I assure you, is not perfect. <laughs> even Paul, he said, no one is good. He said in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. There's only one person who lived this world, walk on this earth, who never committed sin, who remained blameless and pure and holy. And that person is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He didn't, he didn't receive an inherited sin nature from birth. It's like that person seated next to you, each one of us, you know, we have inherited that. The kids, at the kids' church, that's why we're really investing to disciple the next generation because innate in them is the sin. You know, you don't teach a kid to lie, to learn the word mine, mine. You know, it's so natural for them. And so Paul said, no one is good. And then here in, in, in Colossians chapter 1, he said, Once you were alienated from God, you were that before. You were eyes of, just like you are in a penalty box. And you were what? Enemies in your thoughts and in your deeds, in minds because of your evil behavior. You were in, in, in enmity with God. It's like what Adam and Eve did. You think it's just a small thing. You know, just, they just ate of the fruit. What's, what's so wrong with that? You know? But that's what 
sin does. It causes death and alienation. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Wages, plural. Sin, singular. Meaning, even just one sin. Pastor Jerry, you mean that thing that I thought just in my head? I didn't even do anything. I didn't hurt anybody. It's just in my thoughts. For the wages of sin is what? Wages, plural. You know? As if um, you work for McDonald's and you deserve that wage per hour that you agreed with the employer. And it's plural. The wages of sin is what? That's what death does. Even a single sin can be a ticket. So, you know, just like when, when my mom put me in that sack and, and put me in isolation, it was even more painful than being, than being spanked. You know, I can't, I, what the, I was tormented. I can't play with my brothers. You know, I cannot swim in the river. I cannot go out to see my friends. There was nothing to do there. And I was just hanging. I wanted to jump out of it, but I couldn't. It's too high. Sin causes death and alienation. It's worse than the the penalty box. In the penalty box, you know, you can see. And there's a time limit. You're there for two minutes. If you you did something even maybe worse than just... um, Something, a penalty that will that, that warrant two minutes, sometimes five minutes, or sometimes players would even get suspended from, from the game, right? But what about this isol- isolation cell in prison? Have you heard of that? Maybe you see that in the movie, you know? When these people in jail, in, in prison, and, and then um, they do something even... Uh, Something bad, for example, they cause a riot, for example, and they get to that, or they, they, they fight with the, with the warden. They get to be in that isolation cell where there's no light. You know, there's only that small opening so that he can, somebody can, can speak with them or give them food. You know, sin, sin does that. Causes death and isolation. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you. That was before. This is you now. You were reconciled by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Wow. You're not just reconciled in that relationship, but because you have to be holy to have a relationship with the Holy God, not the other way around. Not you, not, you know, He cannot be unholy. God never changed. But because, you know, He gives us a chance, He gave us grace to have that relationship with Him, He presents us holy in His, in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Hebrews 12, verse 14, we saw that from last week, that without holiness, no one can see God. However high we raise our hands, however loud we sing, you know, however, even if you, you, you cry, you know, when you were singing, and you were praying, you are spending time with God, with a cup of tears, that much. Without holiness, it is impossible to see God. But although sin causes death and alienation, that's the bad news. The good news is Jesus' death, as we see in our text, offers us reconciliation. So Ephesians 2, we read that earlier. Paul said, you were dead in your transgressions, in your sins. You were isolated. There was no way that this gap that was caused by this by this problem can be bridged, but Jesus' death, he lived the life that we're supposed to live. And so he's the only one who's 
qualified to take our place on the cross. And his death on the cross opened the door for us to be re reconciled back to God. You know, I used to I used to do my best so that I can be close to God. I, I, I grew up in a, in a very bad environment, very violent, and uh, growing up, you know, I hear everybody, my parents, my siblings, my friends, my neighbors, my uncles, they all swear, you know, it's just normal. It's just normal language. You know, um, I see people, you know, cheating, cutting corners, you know, hating each other, so much violence. Uh, some of our uh, friends, some of my cousins, uh, I got cousins that were killed because um, it's a violent um, environment. But God was so gracious that from that mire, from that kind of life, he saved me. You know, not just changed the way I, I talk, he changed the way I think. He changed the way I see people. He changed the way I see future. He changed everything. He changed my life. I'm not perfect. I'm not claiming that I'm perfect. But because of what Christ did for me, it used to be hard for me to, to grab hold of that idea, wrap my head around that thought that I'm a saint. You know, I'm without blemish. I'm sanctified. I'm justified from my sins. But that's what the death of Christ on the cross meant for each one of us. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, your thoughts and your deeds were evil, you were alienated, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Wow. Even that thing that I did last summer, yes. Maybe just this morning, you know, you had a fight with your spouse because, you know, you can't, you're just pulling them. I don't want to be late. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Even that. Not just your sins today when you repent, even your sins tomorrow. As you repent, God's grace, God's mercy is new every morning. Like the dew every morning, God's mercy is new, is available for you. And so this idea of relationship, that holiness is relationship in its purest form. God calls us into this relationship. Sinners, like you, like me, like Paul, like everybody else, like that person seated next to you, God calls us and invites us to holiness, to present us holy, blameless, without blemish, free from accusation, no condemnation. You know, those words, they, they are words of relationship. If we look at this um, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul were addressing this to the husbands, uh, talking about relationship. First, he talked about relationship, uh, how, how the wife would relate to the husband, and the, the husband relate to the wife, and the children relate to their parents. You know, in verse 25, he said, talking to the husbands, love your wives, he said. Who among you here... Um, you have your spouse, your husband here is with you, all right? You can, you can elbow them. I give you that permission. <laughs> this is for you. Tell them. What did the word of God say? Love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? He gave himself, himself up for her. What for? To make her holy, there's that word again, hagios, to set her apart, to separate her, consecrate her, sanctify her, 
to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of, uh, with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church. The groom doing this for the wife. No, it's not just that white bridal gown that's perfect and flowing, you know, that's very unique, very expensive, very precious. To present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. Those words, they are words of relationship to present, to present us to the Father. Because by our own works and efforts, we fall short. All of our good deeds, even the best version of ourselves, you know, they're like just filthy rags before a holy God. But Jesus doing that, his sanctifying work, his blood shed on the cross. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So that which was, um, um, uh, that was um, shown to us, foreshadowing in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, an innocent animal was killed for that proper covering of man. Christ fulfilled it. He's the perfect lamb who takes away, away the sin of the earth. So Paul said, he has now reconciled you by Christ's physical death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So if you continue, he said, in your faith. What does that mean? If this is none of our doing, if we can never earn this kind of life, to live a holy life, why did he say, it sounds conditional, doesn't it? You know what? Because it is. If you continue in your faith, what does that mean? Like what our worship leader, Micah, was saying earlier, you know, you don't want to lose that first love. You don't want, you know, Christianity is not just praying that prayer. Lord, I was so really deeply moved. I had that encounter. I was struck by your love. And so I, I was even crying during that time. But that's not the end of it. It's just, that's just the beginning of a journey of life being set apart of holiness lived. If you continue in your faith, what does faith mean? We've been, we've been looking at this, the definition of it, right? Faith is being, is being sure of things we hope for and being certain of what we do not see. Now, without faith, it is impossible to see God. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? Even if you volunteer in five ministries, even if you, you know, because you, our limit is only two. We want you to have life, right? We want you to, you know, enjoy your time with your family, with, with, with brothers and sisters. Okay. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moving, immovable, steadfast, standing in the firm foundation, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. And this is the gospel, he said that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You know, it really is about this relationship. This love relationship where in the center is trust, complete trust. That's why it's really living by faith, not by sight. If you continue in that faith, you know, establishing that foundation. You know, the good news is, it's God who will fulfill it. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's available for you. The same grace that says no to sin and yes to godliness. And it's that relationship 
that love relationship where in the core of it is faith. It's complete trust. That relationship with God, that produces the holy life. That life that keeps transforming day by day by day by day. However long you live here on earth, my prayer is that you live a long life. But until your last breath, you know, you keep on living that holy life He called you, being transformed in the image and likeness for which you were created, for that relationship, for that intimate relationship, a life transformed and empowered. And through that, you know, we are able to share, impart that with our family, with our friends, co-workers, with our boss, professors, whoever God will bring into your sphere of relationships, ushering them into rec reconcil reconciliation with the Holy God. So it's really His relationship. It's like I always use this analogy, you know, my, my relationship with Relationship with grace transformed my life. Because I wanted to marry her, I was willing to surrender. And I just gave my time. My everything. Even my love for mountain biking. <laughs> There's so many opportunities, you know, that I miss. Because I value this relationship. Nothing is more important than my, my relationship with her. Relationship transforms. Not religion, not rules. However good they're presented to us, but relationship is what transforms us. You know, that, that, that thought of you are being loved. You're loved well. That when you offend this person that loves you so well, man, you look into their eyes and, I'm so stupid. Why, why did I do that? Why didn't even... You know, it's that relationship. And Grace is just a human being. It's like me. Imagine the kind of life that God is calling you. It's beyond your wildest dreams. You know, He will take you from where you are right now, take, take you from strength to strength, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. That's His promise. Who will say no to that? And it's that relationship that transforms, that produces that transformed life. enables us to share you know you can't help it but share this love this relationship how much you are loved you don't deserve any of it you can never earn it and yet it's freely given all you need to do is to freely receive it right you can't help but share it you know I have a friend he's a part of this church and um, he's born and raised here in, in Edmonton area and um, he, he, he was a pipe fitter in the trades, making lots of money, especially when oil and gas was booming, you know. It's, he would just work and work and work, go up to Fort Mac and then come here, you know, and just spend it. You know, sometimes I talk to these kind of people, they, they're saying, I have, I, I have this very, very good job, high-paying job, and... It takes all my time. I don't have time to spend my money. <laughs> they want, to, you know, they're looking forward for that one week, two weeks of break from work. And then they would party, you know, look for ways to spend their money. He had this house in, in Golden, in BC. And he had this big Harley, you know, the ones uh, years ago, they're just worth 
the, the, the expensive ones, big, big, big buy. But he met an accident in Golden that left him after three months in, in the hospital. He survived, but he was paralyzed. So he became quadriplegic. And he was so desperate, so frustrated. No, no, it's, it's even worse. He, he got so depressed, he, got, he became suicidal. And so he wrote a letter to his parents. He's the only child, only son. Wrote a letter addressed to his parents and his cousins and his friends, everyone who's special to his heart. He was saying goodbye. He was about to kill himself. But you know, just this thought of his parents, this is what he told me. You know, I can't do it. Because they'll be left with nobody. They just retired. And all their time is spent on me right now. But I'm worthless. I'm just a problem. I'm just a pain for them. But he couldn't kill himself. You know that relationship? That relationship changed him. And then later on, he met a nurse from the Philippines. This nurse fell in love with him. He said, when she looks at me, she doesn't see the wheelchair. She sees me as a human being. She loves me. She couldn't believe, he, he, he couldn't believe how much, you know, he's loved. But he grew knowing that love, that love that will lead him to the ultimate love of the Savior, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave himself to the Lord, made him his Lord and Savior. They got married. And now, you know, I, will, I was going to say, and so they live happily ever after, but that's just fairy tale. They're not perfect. They have their own sets of challenges. No, it's not easy to be in a wheelchair, but God made ways for him to provide for his family. They now have a, a one-year-old boy who looks like him. You know, that relationship changed him. And his relationship with God continues to change him. So what if what you need is not more effort, extra effort to live this life? You know, if I would exert even more effort, I would attain this sainthood. I will merit this. I can work things out. I'll be worthy. But what if what you really need to experience is that pure love that is available? That love that you don't deserve and yet God freely gives it to you and offers it to you. Because that relationship will transform you and energize you to live the holy life that God has designed for you. Can we all stand together? Can we all, or can we ask the worship team? Can we use the remainder of our time to just sing to God, talk to God, pray to Him, worship Him?